All about warshipping, spying on Bluetooth with the knob attack, and Capital One was not the only company hit. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris, and this is ThreatWire for August 20th, 2019, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. It's time for a quick shout out, and this one goes out to Dr. Groove, Christopher, Ryan, William, Steve, Max Power 9467, Meads PC Repair Shop, Josh, Peter, Fabian, Brandon, Shannon, nice name, Gregory, and Zach, who joined the Patreon team this week. If you are interested in supporting ThreatWire on Patreon, that link is patreon.com slash Threatwire, and now onto the news. Chosen by our patrons this week is a story all about warshipping. Ars Technica has an excellent article all about warshipping, which is brought on by IBM's offensive security team called X Force Red. The team dubbed this new target infiltration warshipping. Defined, this is when an attacker uses delivery services to ship a device via a postal or package carrier within range of a target's Wi Fi to infiltrate a network remotely all while the attacker never leaves their own home. Warshipping was born out of the older methods of hacking called war dialing and war driving, all of which allow attackers to infiltrate networks remotely. War driving can look suspicious, especially if you have a laptop in tow and a large antenna which is pointed at businesses. So warshipping creates a Trojan horse by getting a smaller, less obtrusive device actually inside a business without detection. The team's device could fit in into a stuffed animal, for example, or onto the bottom of the packaging and delivered right into the target's office. The team used single board computers like a Raspberry Pi Zero W, a small battery, small IoT modems to keep them connected, and command and control servers to ping for specific files or sleep on command. The project cost them under 100 bucks and once built, it could perform wireless attacks, do periodic wireless scans while in transit, and transmit its location data via GPS. In their testing, they were able to gain access to a target's Wi-Fi network using known wireless attacks, which they could then use to pivot to other devices. Now, obviously, eventually the battery would die out and with the device, if hidden, it may get disposed of by an employee. But another example would leave it working infinitely. X-Force Red could hide their warshipping device inside of a plaque with a small solar panel and then send it to somebody with a window facing office with good sunlight. The team recommends disposing of empty boxes quickly, not storing them in highly secured areas, creating a package policy for employees such as not allowing any personal packages to be shipped to the office, or inspecting all boxes that come in. Inspecting any unsolicited packages, having a scanning process, not connecting to rogue Wi-Fi networks, protecting networks with WPA2 or 3 even though those also have their own limitations, avoiding using pre-shared keys and hiring a pen test team are all further recommendations. I commonly complain about smartphone manufacturers getting rid of a headphone jack, and not because of the audio quality. My main concern is security and privacy when using Bluetooth devices. And yes, I am well aware of workarounds and dongles, which is how I currently use my wired earbuds with a 3XL. My concerns about privacy and security for Bluetooth devices develop due to past vulnerabilities with the protocol. So when I read about a new one, my first reaction was, is anyone surprised? This new Bluetooth vulnerability is called the knob attack for key negotiation of Bluetooth attack. This can allow an attacker to brute force encryption keys that are usually used when pairing. Once stolen, they could snoop on the encrypted data or even manipulate the traffic. It affects Bluetooth BR and EDR devices, AKA Bluetooth Classic, with versions 1.0 all the way up to 5.1. That's a lot of devices. This attack can reduce the length of an encryption key used when pairing, sometimes even to a single octet. According to an advisory on Bluetooth.com, quote, not all Bluetooth specifications mandate a minimum encryption key length. So it is possible that some vendors may have developed Bluetooth products where the length of the encryption key used on a BR or EDR connection could be set by an attacking device down to a single octet. 
Sometimes even if a key length is mandated by a device, they may not verify the encryption key length before pairing. Devices can support up to 16 bytes, so more equals better security. Now once an attacker changes the key length, they could brute force the encryption key since decrypting lower key lengths is faster. Then sending malicious commands or snooping on keystrokes or audio, etc., would be a lot easier. Audio headsets, Bluetooth speakers, IoT devices, keyboards, and a lot more could be vulnerable to this hack. Now this attack does require an attacker to be within wireless range of a vulnerable Bluetooth device, and both of those devices attempting to pair to each other would need to have the vulnerability. It would also require a very narrow window of time to perform the attack while the pairing is actually happening, and the attacker would need to block the two devices from pairing with him or herself. Now the vulnerability was discovered by the researchers from the Center for IT Security, Privacy and Accountability, or CISPA, the Singapore University of Technology and Design and the University of Oxford and was reported to the ICASI, the Industry Consortium for Advancements of Security on the Internet. And well-known brands like Microsoft, Apple, Intel, Cisco, and Amazon also heard about the vulnerability. Now it is currently labeled as CVE 2019-9506 and so far there are no reports of this being used in the wild and the researchers presented their findings at a security symposium. A paper on on the subject is also available for reading online. Now, the Bluetooth Special Interest Group updated the Bluetooth core specification to recommend minimum encryption key lengths of seven octets for BR and EDR connections, as well as a qualification program. Older devices can be updated to enforce the new minimum length policy. So vendors must patch older devices and users must update their devices to said patches in order to not be vulnerable. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my supporters. Those personalized thank you videos are going out this week as well to everyone who pledged during the special offer. Also, I decided that I wanted to start a security and privacy audio podcast as part of the ThreatWire feed. That's my next Patreon goal. So if you want to help, check out my community. The link is in the description below. And also a huge thanks to our Hush Puppy Perk Level patrons for sending in their fur baby photos. I love them so much, so keep them coming. I would like to say a special thank you to David for sending in this story pick. Paige Thompson, the hacker behind the Capital One hack, also hit more than 30 companies alongside the bank. According to media reports, these may include Michigan State University, Ford, Vodafone, and the Ohio Department of Transportation, and a lot more. Now, during her hearing, federal prosecutors included this information in a memorandum filed in Seattle on Tuesday. While the companies have not been named publicly by prosecutors, not all of them were impacted in the same way. Some did not have any personally identifiable data that was stolen, and the data varied from company to company. Law enforcement received terabytes of stolen data purported to be from these companies on her home servers. The FBI is still trying to identify all of the companies involved in the thefts, and the investigation is ongoing. None of the data was apparently shared or sold by Thompson, but prosecutors want to add additional charges for each theft of the data. Prosecutors also believe that the hacker is a risk to herself and others, so they are keeping her detained during the court proceedings with a detention hearing set for August 23rd. Amazon Web Services denies knowing about any breaches of data coming from Paige Thompson. The hacker was an employee of AWS and likely used the same technique in her other thefts. Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon has asked Amazon Web Services if the hacks were caused by a server-side request forgery or an SSRF vulnerability, which the company confirmed in a letter on August 13th. Though being able to use an SSRF vulnerability first required Thompson to gain access through a misconfigured firewall installed by Capital One. So Amazon is placing the blame on Capital One, but they are also planning to be more proactive with customers by scanning public IP addresses and communicating with customers if they find vulnerabilities. So it only took millions of persons' private data to be stolen for AWS to actually take this seriously. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I am Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet.